Hi, I'm Tim Ellis. Thanks for joining us for Laneway Live. I first chatted to tonight's guest about a week and a half ago. And at the end of the chat, I pressed the stop record button and got this. <laughs> end of the recording there. Thank you so much for chatting. Thanks, Matt. Uh which answers the age old question. If two magicians chat on zoom and you don't record it, is it a show? No, it's not. But thankfully he was able to rearrange his schedule and he's back with us tonight. Please welcome the coolest magician on earth, Rudy Kobe. Hey Tim, how you doing? You are not only, not only cool, but you are prepared for coronavirus. Yes, I am. Quarantine is my life. <laughs> <laughs> and you are quarantined in, a, in an actual theater. I am, yeah. I'm quarantined in uh, Texas. Beautiful uh, Frisco, Texas at Randy Pitchford, who is a um, empresario. He owns Gearbox Software, so he makes these great games. But he's um, also a magician. He was a magician first. So he actually constructed this beautiful theater. It's called the Peacock Theater. And it's in Frisco, Texas. And this is actually in his house. So when they asked me to uh, quarantine with them, I'm no dummy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually I'm in this giant house with a deserted theater. And um, I've been here for one month exactly, actually. So where were you before that? I was in Las Vegas at home. And I'm a single guy, so that's a, that was a little. I mean, actually, I've been I've been quarantined for most of my adult life, you know, so it's it's okay. But um, but um, it's a little weird because in Las Vegas, seeing that empty, you know, down here it's kind of a you know, uh, I don't know. I feel like the Phantom of the Opera or something in this place. But so uh, how did you? But yeah, Las Vegas seeing empty streets is very weird. Yeah, and you had to fly from Las Vegas to Texas. I did, I did. That's why I have these rubber. I actually, I had two sets of masks on and it was it was disturbing how many people didn't have masks on none of the flight attendants uh security did but no, you know not many other people so uh yeah so i i had multiple rubber gloves and masks and it was still a little scary though to be honest i've, I've seen photos of uh recent flights uh within america where they've packed them in it's just a crowded plane no masks nothing right when I, when I came here, it was on April 1st, I was already quarantined for two weeks in Las Vegas. And so I came just at the moment, because uh, I was invited before that. And I was, um, you know, so I stayed in Vegas at first because it was almost, I was supposed to be in Europe. And, you know, I, I had tickets to um, Texas, Austin, Texas, for the premiere of the Magic Castle movie. There's a movie, a documentary being made about the Larson family. And I'm one of the performers in it. So I bought a ticket and I was going to perform at the premiere. And, uh, and that was supposed to be on the 15th, March 15th or something. So I was in Vegas for two weeks alone and then decided to come down here. So I went to the airport and there was nobody, nobody, you know. And um, on the entire flight, I think there were four people. Very crazy. So at least you felt safe on that one. I don't know that I did feel safe. I've never been so paranoid, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was really crazy um, because none of the uh, flight attendants, I mean, but I had my handy wipes. I was wiping off everything and it was like, you know, like a zombie movie or something. Amazing. I have to admit, I, when I flew to Genie convention last year in November, I was mm. taken aback because I'm sitting down in the, in the seat, a lady sits next to me and she immediately takes out a whole lot of handy wipes and just starts wiping down the tray and wiping all the things. This is no virus or anything. This is right. just a normal habit. Yeah. No, and, uh, and you realize that those people, the crazy people, were right. You know? I mean, seriously. So how was the genie convention? I missed it. I was in China. I was actually in China, and we rehearsed for eight days in Wuhan, actually where the, where the virus came from. So I was there up until December 10th. And then a week or two later, the news comes about the vi virus. And then I went, to, I was in Italy in February, came back like at the March 3rd or March 10th. So I just missed it in Italy also. So I'm not taking credit or blame, but, but I've just <laughs> managed to miss the disasters. Yeah. So I know, I know with uh, magicians and shows, you tend to just be in the theater and the hotel and that's it. 
but did you get to go out in Wuhan and actually see the uh, the n notorious wet markets? Oh yeah, of course. No, I mean we did. A, I was in Wuhan for eight days or ten days for I think our rehearsals were in Wuhan. I think the company that brought us over is located there, and, and you know it's a shame because China. Um, you probably know because you're. Cl I think you're closer, right? You've probably been to China more than I have, but for. You know, if you if you went to China 20 years ago, it felt like you were going back in time, mm. you know, and not always in a good way. And even 10 years ago, it was sort of like that. But now, you know, China, I did a 50 city tour over four and a half months, starting in uh, end of July until December. And it was fantastic. You know, the best, you know, 50 or 60 different beautiful theaters, like state of the art you know, opera type houses, you know, like you would go see the illusionist, like the Sydney opera house, literally that big, best technical, best, you know, giant backstages. The cities are all coordinated. Like all the skyscrapers have led lights with matching video, you know, shows going across all the buildings, you know, I mean, it's communist, so they can really coordinate. I mean, all the buildings had it. And, um, but it's really modern, you know, every city has a beautiful mall, you know, nice families, you know, no crime, you know, so it's a shame that it's kind of getting a bad, you know, a bad scene. But then again, you go to the grocery stores and it's, you know, <laughs> the same way it's hot dogs and hamburgers in America, there are eels and big frogs and, you know, I mean, you know, so it's a little crazy. So, uh, but I didn't see any bats or anything like that. You know, I think that's, that's more of a rare thing. Under the counter. <laughs> yes, under the counter. But I, I think those bats are no worse than a, what's in a hot dog in America. I mean, I'm from New York, and it's horrible, you know, what's ground up in those. How is it down there? Oh, it's, it's going all right here. We're, uh, we're, we're controlling it nicely, and uh, we now have an app uh, on our phones now, an app you download, which uh, ah. is, uh, is actually, it's, it's controversial a little bit. A lot of people think the government's taking away our freedom. They're tracking us all the way The way it works right. is, uh, if you go anywhere near somebody who has already said on the app, okay, I've been confirmed that I've got coronavirus. If you go near them, the app will alert you. Mm. And so it also is a way. Wow. Of, so it only activates if you go near someone. So it's not constantly tracking you. Now you have to take the government's, you have yes. to trust the government and say, okay, yes. they've, they've got oversight committees. They've got other people and there's transparency and stuff like that. But if you, if you say, okay, this is our best chance of sorting it out quickly. Let's just do this. And uh, apparently there are committees that say they're going to delete all the data as soon as it's finished. And we hope they will honor that. But uh, well, it, it's paying, yeah, the, paying dividends. Yeah. The weird thing is in China, that's all it is, is facial tracking. Mm. You know, every like train station you go to, you, you have your passport, but you show it and you, you look in a little camera and it and they have all your info, you know? So I think that's probably why they're, if you believe them, you know, which I, you know, I mean, they, I guess they're opening up everything. So they must be, they must have done pretty good, but they were able to really lock everyone down because they have all your info. Yeah. And if you're out of your house, they know it, you know, it's a little scary, but um, you know, I mean, I think China is probably going to be the first place open again because they were the first ones to close down. So, well, um, New Zealand uh, has almost completely eradicated the virus now. Wow. And uh, it's going to be interesting because I think uh, they're planning September, they're going to open up Australia and New Zealand to communicate and, and travel between each other. Wow. And possibly Singapore as well. But other countries, like, I mean, I don't know how long it's going to be before we're able to go to America or Americans are going to visit us because it seems like... Um, the, the decision between um, do we want to get rid of the coronavirus or do we want to keep the economy going is the big yeah. civil war at the moment. Yeah. And here in America, it's um, the more conservative states, you know, are saying don't take our freedoms away and all that. And, and uh, so Texas, where I am, just opened up today. They yeah. opened up everything, not everything, but movies. And, and I forget what's not, I think restaurants aren't open or they're allowed to open, but it's only 25% or, you know, so it's going to be funny to see what happens in two or three weeks. If, you know, if, if it spikes up or not, yeah. but um, you know, we are not leaving. <laughs> We're not going out of this house. The Peacock <laughs> theater is not open. 
No, that's right. So, and by the way, the Peacock Theater, like I said, Randy Pitchford and his wife, Christy, um, they're big fans. Of, Randy's an incredible magician. He owns Genie Magazine and also the Genie Convention. He's kind of hands off. He lets Richard Kalpin, you know, continue that. Richard Kalpin's still in charge of Genie, but he, does, he just wanted to make sure that he that uh, we would still have Genie Magazine as a real magazine, you know? And like I said, he's, he's um, you know, Cardini's um, nephew, great nephew, you know? So he was, um, if you ever go to the Magic Castle, there's an incredible Cardini exhibit downstairs at the Magic Castle. We'll see his, his performing costume, his cane and a video, you know? Um, and, and Randy actually is responsible for that. Um, but he um, has this incredible theater because such a fan of magic, but his company is company Gearbox, big company that produces video games like Borderlands, like the biggest, this is the number one video game right now. And, uh, but he misses going to uh, the Magic Castle or Brookledge, which is uh, the Larson family's theater where the best variety of acts are. Mm-hmm. So he created his own, this is a reproduction of Brookledge. You know, and his house looks like the Magic Castle. So, you know, so he's used this, his success to sort of support other performers. And, um, and I, I'm, li- I'm here because um, I spend my Christmases down here. They, they, it, they, it really feels like a family. And the best of the best, Penn and Teller have performed here. Piff the Magic Dragon, you know, Tape Face, Johnny Thompson before he passed, you know. So, um, you know, it's this beautiful little 80-seat theater that's invitation only. And uh, the plan is one day there'll be, you know, Peacock in every major city in America. This is sort of the test, you know. And, uh, you, and you're going to, you're talking about uh, doing some streaming shows? Yes. We, we you know, we were going to do it. Like we, we, um, we were, yes, we're, we're planning on doing a streaming show from the Peacock Theater. And it's funny because we were going to just jump right into it. We were going to do it, you know, we we were, you know, we have access to tech and I'm here in person, but we were going to stream different people from, um, and we were going to do it last week. And literally we saw how hard it is actually to do a streaming show and to do, you know, the, what you're doing is miraculous. And even we had a weird thing where, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's amazing how technical stuff mm-hmm. is uh, the enemy of kind of making it feel live or, you know, um, so we decided to put it off a week or two just to make sure that, you know, that we knew how not to avoid the mistakes other people have done, you know, where you, you, you promote this thing and all of a sudden there's no sound or, you know, you, your Wi-Fi is not right or the other person that you're, that is performing there, you know, it's all those things that can go wrong, yeah. but hopefully we'll be uh, doing one next like, uh, I think, I don't know when this will air, but maybe May 9th, like next Saturday. Well, that'll be May, is that May 10th? It, I think no. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yes, it'll be your May 10th. It'll be May, our May 9th. I'm going to put a link down there for it if you send me the okay. link where it is, because yes. uh, I'm doing a streaming show <clears throat> on May 9th. Yes. Yeah, and, I want to uh, see your show. <laughs> <laughs> I do, no. I, it won't be Peacock uh, Theater, but it'll be fun. <laughs> No, no, no. It, but I don't think, I don't think, you know, I'm very lucky because we are in this beautiful theater. You know, it's, it's almost a joke. You know, when I stream, when I do video calls to my friends because they're doing shows and, you know, and then I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm roughing it too. <laughs> you know, it's lighting and sound. And, um, but I, it's funny is I've seen other people who maybe have home theaters. You have a home theater and other people have even like bigger setups, but bigger setups does not necessarily mean better show you know it's it's you know it, uh, i have a little more space to perform mm. but essentially it's you know the people that i think are really killing it are the people that have thought it out and the benefits of the streaming platform and you know i mean i think charlie fry our friend charlie fry oh, is yeah. probably doing the best job of anybody just you know um I, I, so anyway i think this is great having this but in a way um you know some of the best stuff i've seen is just people in their kitchen, you know, or in their you know, yeah. backyard. And, and it's got to be, there's got to be interactive element to it. Otherwise that you might as well just record a video and put it up. Yeah. I just posted if on my, on my uh, on Facebook and or on my Twitter today, there's a great article about, um, I don't know if you saw it or not. And I think it's in the, not the wall street journal or fortune or something, but it's about virtual magic shows about companies hiring virtual magicians or virtual jugglers. And, um, and it's fantastic. You should link to that, you know, mm. and it's really, really, you know, has quotes from Penn, Penn, Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller saying that basically 
the world, you know, everything we do is going to be changed for a year. You know, he thinks it's a, he thinks it's a year easy. At least, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, and, and, you know, you've told me about what you did, what you've done recently. You sound like you have your, you know, you have your finger on the button and other people like Jeff McBride has been doing, or mm -hmm. magician Jeff McBride, if people don't know, he's from Vegas, but he's been doing sort of interactive things for mm -hmm. a long time, you know, uh, but then I've seen, yeah, then I, but then I've seen other people who uh, are really good entertainers and really, and have access to all the technical stuff in the world, but it doesn't, come off good because like you said it doesn't come off live or mm. you know when when there's not applause it can feel really flat i mean it's almost like you've got to acknowledge mm. the differences of what you're doing you know well, you know look at look at the copperfield shows where uh he he sort of tried to work magic on tv he didn't just televise his shows i mean there was an element in the st first few shows where it was just yes would bring the cameras into the theater but he would then have the cameras come onto the stage. He'd do like a, a big illusion piece with a bit of close up in the middle and the cameras would zoom in. So he'd take advantage of the medium. He didn't just go, this is my act. You can film it if right. you, you know, right. it, nothing looks worse. No. And his, his, uh, believe me, when I did my television shows, I studied Copperfield. I mean, I told him this personally, I went through each one of his specials and watched them minute by minute, second by second, and actually wrote down wh what effects. And, you know, I mean, I went through, I mean, I, I have, you know, like a serial killer's set of notebooks going through his stuff, analyzing camera angles. And, and, um, and then you realize the genius of what David Copperfield did. And I don't think magicians even realize it now, you know, or they would do better television. It's, but um, it's amazing how much of his specials, you know, a lot of it was done live, but a lot of it, was not done live and you don't realize it you know because to get good shots you know like behind, not just obvious things like when you're behind copperfield or it's a thing going around or a camera going around him but other things it's you know he would shoot the show live but then he would shoot it again you know to get the best angles and then sort of edit them together so it had a live feel but wasn't necessarily live you know he approached it more like a movie than he did just yeah. as a television show and then all the interactive stuff um genius i mean really fantastic uh, well with your tv show your uh, several tv specials yes uh you had a different feel again you, yours was more yeah. like a live comic book almost like uh maybe a touch of peewee's play yeah oh was, yeah absolutely no what's really weird is paul rubens peewee came to see my show at the magic castle recently and um and he and he loved it I mean, and I've had lots of celebrities. I've met lots of celebrities, but I couldn't even talk. To, I couldn't ask for a photo. I mean, because he, he influenced my, uh, my, my show more than anybody, more than anybody. I mean, maybe the original Batman series from 1960, you know, like, you know, Adam West probably influenced my character. But as far as, um, as far as my show, Paul Rubens, that, his original show, the more, the more adult version, which was an HBO special uh, before his kid series, just to influence. So it was funny. He saw the show and he really liked it. I mean, he loved it. So everybody else was getting photos and he said, Oh, I really like your show that uh, I'd love to see it again. And I said, Oh, I'm doing a show tomorrow night at Brookledge, you know, for Erica Larson. He goes, Oh, I'll come and see you. And I went, no, 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 I'm just doing three minutes. And uh, yeah, I'll come, you know? So the next night, and it was actually a gearbox party. It was the, the company, this video game company of, of yeah. Randy's was having their uh, big convention. It was a electro E3, which is a big video game convention it was in LA. So they had the party at Brookledge. So anyway, I arrive and I'm unloading my car with the chainsaw and my little table and stuff. And all of a sudden, Hey Rudy. And I look over and it's, <laughs> Paul, it's Paul Rubens. And I was like, oh, and he goes, hey, need some help? And I was like, oh, no. And he goes, so he comes over and imagine it, it's literally, for me, it's, you know, he's my hero. He's like literally, yeah. he's Brad Pitt or something. Too. You know, so he said, can I help you? No, no, no. And he goes, no, no, no. And he's grabbing my chainsaw, grab my chainsaw on my legs. And we start walking. I was like, wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> I said, I just, have to, I just have to say something before we do, before we go in, you know, I said, you know, when I said last night I was a fan, I, I, I'm not just a fan, you know, I'm ridiculously, I said, my show wouldn't exist without your show. And I, and I said, and I said, what I mean by that is I didn't just, I wasn't just inspired by your show. Um, I learned how to write my show like yours because I wanted it to be like a like you said a live comic book with characters not just me 
I wasn't just really Kobe magician. I was lab man, defender of science. And my assistant wasn't a girl. She was a robot, Nikki Terminator, the world's most beautiful robot. So I really wanted them to feel like an episode of the Muppet Show, the old Muppet Show or Pee Wee's Playhouse. So I was trying to write the script and it didn't feel right. You know, like how long do you bring a different character in if you're doing a magic show to have it feel fresh? You know, if you overdo something. So I went through the, that original HBO special and I wrote it out by hand. Every line, the same way I did with Copperfield, every line, every stage direction. Um, and then I took that handwritten version and I typed it out like a script, like just like the, the script format. And then I wrote my show. And what it did is it taught me a certain rhythm. You know, like, because if you watch his show, characters come in, but they're only there for a minute or two. Or da, 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 and, the, and it's the plot, moving the plot forward. So anyway, I wrote it in, and I may, I may have done that a couple times, actually, with that special. So anyway, I told, I said, so really, literally, your show is the DNA for my show, you know? And he was just like, yeah, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> I said, so now we can be friends, you know, now, you know, he sent me six different videos for my birthday, you know, we actually had become friends, you know, uh, but I had to get, I had to at least mention that I was a, the scariest stalker ever, <laughs> potentially, you know, but um, so, you know, I think it's so important is to give credit to your heroes. You know, if you're inspired by, so I say that all the time, if you're inspired by somebody, give them credit. It doesn't hurt you to say, oh, you know, it's just funny when I see, when I sometimes I'll see somebody doing a show that is similar to mine. And you can tell, you know, like you can, like when Jeff McBride is a magician with masks, you know, and back in the day when everyone was copying him and he was my hero, he still is my hero, but he would go see a show a person was doing masks like Jeff McBride, and they would say, you know what? I never saw your, your show before. And it's like, we would both look at them like they were, you know, like yeah. they were crazy. It's like, we, we know you saw, you know, you know it, because if you didn't see it, you could still do masks, but you wouldn't do it like Jeff McBride, you know? And the same thing when, when uh, I can't tell you how many people I've met over the years, because now I'm, you know, they saw my special 20 years ago, you know? Um, when the people that come up, or if you see a show and it's similar to mine and they say, oh, yeah, I never heard of you before. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you can always tell. But the people that come up to you and say, just like I did to Paul Rubens, you know what? I just got to say, man, thank you so much for doing what you do. You inspired me. To, it's like I would do anything for those people, mm. you know. And um, and with with Facebook or you know Twitter or anything, you can get a hold of your heroes, you mm. know. If you talk, if you're in an interview and you happen to talk about someone that you really like or you really admire, you know it's like those people. Because I lived with Marilyn Manson for people may not know, but for ten years I worked on his show and lived with him. You know, he's my buddy. But even people like that, they Google their names every so often. You know, they have a Google alert and it shows up yeah. in their email. And if you're talking and saying nice things about them, it's very likely that your heroes will hear about you. So it's so much better to credit your heroes, credit your inspirations. Um, first of all, it's the right thing to do. But second of all, you know, there's, it, uh, yeah, could reward, you know, you one day. Then you get the other people who are a bit too inspired by your, your act, like uh, recently <laughs> the Russian guy who did essentially the Rudy Code. Yes, that's funny. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, someone did my. I mean, it that happens more than you think. You know, it's a. Uh, you know, I used to be. You know, now that I'm older, you know, I take I try to see that stuff as a compliment. It only hurts you when they're performing and like you know there was you, there was a guy in I used to go to Brazil all the time. You know, I worked in Rio de Janeiro and to and in. Um, uh, San Paulo and all these places. And I don't so much anymore because there's a Rudy Kobe down there that does like the America's um, Brazil's got talent or whatever, you know? And, um, and it's just very, very weird, you know? And then, you know, sometimes I'll, you know, people will see them and then call them out on YouTube or whatever and try to, you know, and, uh, and then sometimes they'll stop. But a lot of times these people think that they're such big fans of yours that, they look at it like they're complimenting you in a weird way. You know, like, like if, if you like Barbara Streisand and you were singing her songs, you would think nothing, you would think that Barbara Streisand would get mad at you, you know? So I'm not defending it. I'm just saying it's a very weird thing. Well, um, with, with songs though, I mean, at least you're paying the copyright to sing yes. the songs. You're paying the royalties yes. to sing the songs. 
and you're not dressing up like Barbara Sars. And yes. even if you do, you're doing a tribute act, you know, I'm, yes. I'm doing a tribute. Like it, it, I've often thought, uh, you know, on the cruise ships, you often see someone doing a Neil Diamond tribute or an Elvis right. Presley tribute or something like that. Sometimes the magicians are doing David Copperfield tributes, but without actually presenting Absolutely. it as that. <laughs> Absolutely. No, but even now, I just did a sh the show in Italy and I was on a big show and you're, um, you're on a show and a guy, uh, again, very nice people, like the nicest people in the world, but they're doing, um, you know, David Copperfield, I mean, like music, poses, everything. And then they're coming up to me and saying, you know, you really influenced me. I was a, I'm such a big fan of yours. And you want to go, then stop doing other people's material, you know, or I mean, I can't tell you it's how many times I've, I'm going in and doing a show and then in the same show, someone's, oh, I'm so inspired by you. And it's like, yes, I understand. But if you're in the same show with me, you can't do my stuff, you know? So, and sometimes they, you, sometimes you could talk sense into them, you know? And if it's a, if it's a young person, they get where, you know, I would, I would just be a guy you should be afraid of back in the day. You know what I mean? Uh, if you heard from me, it was a not a good thing. But now it's like when I see a young person doing it in a talent show or a contest or something, I am kind of flattered by it almost, you know? Mm. It's the older people who show no better, you know? And sometimes you can write those people or contact them and steer them away from doing that. But to a certain extent, I'm a very lucky person, you know? It's like I'm – Everyone has to be inspired by somebody. And I was inspired by Harry Anderson and people like that. Like as far as magic, Paul Harris was my big, biggest inspiration when I was a kid. You know, just his, the way he, he was a comic book. I mean, mm -hmm. it, he is the way he, it was incredible close up, but the persona and all that stuff, the writing was it. it and, but Harry Anderson, you know, I mean, I was probably a baby Harry Anderson when I was 10 years old or something, you know, and, and you could certainly, if you see my act, my talking material, you know, it's a different character, but it's the spine of it is inspired by him. But the thing is, when I met Harry Anderson, I told him, I, you know, and, and you could see when even someone like that, who was a big TV star and all that, he, you know, he was very thankful of it. And he gave me permission to do certain, I, I would say, oh, this one routine you did 20 years ago. Oh, that's the best thing in the world. I mean, I, that, I'm so jealous of that. And I told them, I, I would love to do a version of it. He goes, well, you should do it. And I was like, no, no, no. Because, and he was like, no, I don't do it anymore. You know, you should, I would love you to do it. So then I had permission from Harry Anderson to do a couple of routines that, you know, and, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's sometimes the same thing happens with me. Someone will say, oh, I saw you do that thing where you pound the nail in your face. And da, da, da. I love that part where you do this or that. And if they come up to me and they're really nice, chances are I'll go, you know what? You have my permission to do that part of it because you like it so much or do your own version of it. And, um, and you know, it's, it's amazing how uh, many people will kind of embrace you that way, you know, mm. if you, you come at them the right way rather than just stealing it and then pretending you don't know them. You know? They're, always, they're always afraid that you're going to say, oh, that's great. Well, I'd rather you don't do it. Yes. But and, and most of the time, um, what I'll try to do is say, well, you shouldn't do that because I'm still doing it. But, um, uh, but here's another idea. Yes. Yes. Here's another idea or good luck with your other stuff. Or, but uh, I'm just saying is more and more, maybe it's getting older and chilling out a little bit or, or having more confidence in myself or, or knowing that there's so many people out there just stealing it that, you know what, give this guy a little, you know, a little bit of rope. I mean, a little slack and um, be supportive and, uh, you know, it's a weird thing. It's a weird thing. And also when you begin, like for me or for any, when you're first trying to make your mark, mm. if somebody copies from you, then they could potentially hurt you from becoming su successful. Cause if they go on a TV show and they became famous for it, you know, like I do this thing with four legs, right? The, 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 the things that made me that caught on, if somebody did it on America's Got Talent, you know, or in a certain country, then I can't do it anymore. You know, there've been very famous people that have gotten things stolen and, you know, and, and uh, but that was more a problem, you know, a couple decades ago when there was only four channels, in, you know, in America or two yeah. channels in Europe or a couple channels in Australia, you know, yeah. but now we have the internet and, you know, hundreds of channels and, and know, it's, it's also less of a problem. 
very easy for people to record their act first and, and post it somewhere. Exactly so right. You can say, well, look, here's the evidence. Where's your evidence? Who did it first? Exactly right. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's like, you know, I, I'm not giving anybody excuses to steal things, but I've had it happen so many times and I'm still here. You know what I mean? I still travel around the world. I still, you know, so, and most of the time they're just hurting themselves because I've worked with the biggest agents. I've worked, you know, if they, they're, most of the time they're going to be called out as being copycats, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, the, it's the other thing I, I will say to people, uh, I have often when I'm in Asia, younger magicians will come up to me and they'll say, Oh, I'm, I'm buying this new illusion. And they'll show me a photo of the illusion. And I'll say, Oh, that's the, uh, the Jim Steinmeier illusion. Yeah. I said, do you like Jim Steinmeier stuff? And they go, Oh yeah, I do. I go, would you like to meet him one day? Yeah, I'd love to. I say, well, if you get that copy, <laughs> you'll never meet him. He won't want to. Yeah, talk to you. that's right. So, that's your choice. No. And it's also, you know what, the, the most important, I think in, in life, but being a magician, the most important moment in being a magician to me, the, the thing you should um, reach for is to make your mark, stand out in a crowd. You know what I mean? Like I grew up with Jeff McBride, you know, so I, I knew Jeff McBride before he was famous. And then when he came up with the act that made him famous, I've known Jeff since I was nine years old yeah. and he was 14 and we were in a small town. We were both born in the same one room hospital, this delivery room, you know? <laughs> so I think we have different, we have different mothers, but maybe, I don't know, there might have been a po popular mailman, but in this tiny little town. So I would see Jeff McBride once a year at this fair and his father was a lawyer for it. So I'd see Jeff McBride. The first time I saw him, he was, he was wearing, he it was, not, you know, he was 14. He was wearing skin tight pants, a green set of tails and um, no makeup and doing kind of like kiss, you know, yeah. he had like suns and moons on his costume and doing like a kind of rock and roll magic show with doves and kiss boots. And, you know, and then next year I saw him that was gone. And he looked, he had my makeup t-shirt, like Marcel Marceau, a leather hat, you know, um, and doing, um, you know, Miami cut and restore rope. Da, da, da. The next year, makeup's gone. He's wearing all black. He's very much like Jeff Sheridan. Have you ever seen yeah. him? You know, who, who was Jeff's, you know, Jeff was inspired by him. But then the next year, so it, every year he had a different version, but always the highest technical, the most talented magician on the planet, maybe. You know, Johnny Thompson was talented in a different way, but Jeff McBride certainly, you know, if I had to put, you know, he's one of the best. I mean, maybe, for me, maybe the best, but, you know, top five of anyone's list as far as being able to do close up and sleight of hand and everything. But still, he wasn't, again, he was actually bothered by the fact that he wanted to be famous. You know what I mean? Because he, he was as talented as anybody else, but he was not famous like them. You know, he, so, I mean, we're only talking for a couple of years, you know, because by the time he was 18 or 19, he hit. Well, anyway, every single year would be a little different. Then finally, five years down the line, six years down the line, he combined it all together. So now he took the makeup from a previous act and the skin tight pants, you know, the rock and roll look with the boots from a different act. The, 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 um, um, you know, the elegance of Jeff Sheridan, the, but, but the theatricality of a different, era so it all came together and then he found instead of just doing magic randomly with objects he would manipulate masks that looked like his makeup and then boom got a television thing you know and when when i saw him when i saw that act he walked on stage and the tails and masks and da, 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 i was like boom i don't want to swear but i was like he's going to become famous he's done it you know you could feel it in your bones you know when you see someone and boom oh, you know, you're a little jealous. You're like, oh, why can't I do that? And that's a good feeling to have, you know. You want to find that thing that separates you from the pack. You know, what, let's say there's the, the show, like, a, like, let's say simple goal, magic invention show. Mm. And it's the best of the best. It's a Saturday night show. Okay. There's going to be Jeff McBride. There's going to be Rudy Kobe. There's going to be all these different people. And you, can you be on that show or not? Can you do something on that show that will stand out and be that level and you're worth going on that stage. And for you, I saw you do it at FISM, I guess. I guess it was FISM, but with the, with the rap thing, with the six card repeat, you could do that and hold your own on any stage, right? You could, you could, you could get booked and do that. The same way I was doing three minutes when I was, 
you know, I was doing this four legged act, boom. I was every city traveled the world, went from being unknown to traveling the world and being, you know, and achieving my goals one, you know, one city at one country at a time. And that's what people should be striving for is finding that three minutes that makes you, you know, um, you know, makes you a world famous magician. If you have three minutes with a, with an original character, Mm. strong magic and original character, you can be famous, you know? So it's better to work on that than just copy someone else's show. Yeah. And it's, it's so easy, unfortunately, to do magic, just to buy a trick and just do it out of the box and that's you're right. a magician, but uh, yeah. it's so much harder, so much harder to just make that transition from everybody else to that one unique identity. Yeah. And it's so, yes. Uh, but the thing is, it's, you know, I, I try to say that it's, it's not easy. It's not easy because for me, the, the real way, the only way to really do it is you've got to show respect to magic and the only way to show respect to magic is to really learn it right so like vernon said you know i mean i won magic contests when i was 11 and 12 i won the society of american magicians magician of the year in upstate new york you know but i was like competing against jeff mcbride you know <laughs> so it's like you know it's, you don't win against jeff mcbride right so uh, but i did one year you know and and um and but I got bored with it, you know, like even at, like I only started at nine by 11 or 12. I was kind of getting bored because I used to draw comic books and, you know, and do special makeup effects and do super eight movies where I had monsters. And, and uh, so magic kind of was boring. And I saw that everybody was kind of copying each other. And I wanted to come up with an act that had the same strength of, of Jeff McBride, to be honest, of that, you know, he's dynamic and, you know, you know, can perform in a stage and commands your attention. But I didn't want to copy him like all my other friends in upstate New York were all Jeff McBride clones, you know? And, and because I got to know Jeff from when I was nine, I was just a fanboy. I was just a shy guy, you know, after a show would help him clean up the stage. And, you know, I got to hang out with him between shows. I mean, you, you just make yourself useful. I've had people do that, you know, apprentices, you know, do that to me. Um, you know, one guy, uh, this guy, Jonathan Bryce from um, Minneapolis saw me at a, at a IBM convention. And he comes up to me in the dealer's room. I said, I just wanted to tell you, I love your act and you inspired me. Da, 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 da. And I said, oh, good. What are you doing in two weeks? And he was like, what do you mean? I said, do you want to go to Monte Carlo? I, my other assistant just quit. I need a guy, you know, and taught him my neon door frame act. And then two weeks later, he was, um, you know, in my show, Monte Carlo, went to the Edinburgh Festival and, you know, um, you know, and just did a show with me in Vegas last week. We, after 20 something years, we just sort of got together and he did it again. Um, you know, saw 20 or 30 countries traveled around the world. And it's just, again, that was, you know, it, you know, showing respect and coming up to someone instead of, you know, having an attitude, you know, come up and say, Hey, you really inspired me, blah, 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 blah. It just shows you, you can make things happen by being sincere, you know, and, and giving credit, and, you know? So, um, but um, that's what people should be striving for is finding their place in the magic world. You know, become a, I wrote these lecture notes called how to become a world famous magician or just look like one, you know, but it was really about finding your character, yeah. how to create original material. Cause if you have a three minute long act, you don't need an hour. If you have three minutes, you could travel the world tomorrow and people are looking for acts, you yeah. know, and it's, it really is coming up with that idea of what that character is and what the music is and, you know, something that people, can't forget like when you the act starts within 10 seconds you have your attention has a strong ending an original character and people are looking for it mm. and with all these contests now you really only need 90 seconds and you can really become famous you know well, you've <laughs> it's been, a little uh, short but yeah you've been traveling but, uh, to quite a few magic conventions lately which is uh which is interesting crazy <laughs> you, you, did, you did give up magic for a little while i did yeah yeah, you know, when I got, I had my goals. I wanted to work the Crazy Horse in Paris, which is the most famous nightclub. Um, it coincidentally, has 24 naked girls in it. That, that had nothing to do with me wanting to perform. It was the, the best acts. Norm Nielsen, who passed away recently, was a performer there. And George Carl, famous mime. And Otto Wesley and uh, Finn John. Very, the best club in all of Europe. And I always wanted to work there. Um, so I had my goals and I wanted my own TV specials like Copperfield. And then when I got that, I went through a situation where I had my ma a manager that was embezzling from me and, and um, all this bad stuff happened. So I got kind of, you know, just full depression. It was like, what the hell, you know? And, um, and then I met Marilyn Manson 
and I went on, I created for him for 10 years. We became close friends. I ended up living with him and I designed his shows for 10 years with him and appeared in the shows with him. And it was fun to be in another person's world. You know, I was still doing magic um, and designing magic, but, um, uh, you know, I kind of got to step away from the world of magic because I got, I get pissed off, you know, magicians stealing from each other and back, you know, it's, you know, all the magicians are gossips and they backbiting and stealing from each other. So, and I, I got a lot of that. A lot of my friends were stealing from me. And I, like I said, I had a situation where someone was stealing money and embezzling. All the bad things happened. And I'm like, you know, literally a nine-year-old at heart. I'm a, you know, I'm still, hey, come on, let's do a show. You know, let's find this, we'll find this, <laughs> you know, barn and do a show. So I needed to get away from it. And then I realized years later, of course, when I was, you know, mature a little bit, that that's every single profession ever. You know what I mean? There are 99%, they say 99% of everything is crap, you know, or 90% of everything is crap. You know, performers, shows, you know, I was that person who looked at things like that. Um, and I you know, had a, you know, lovely wife who just said, we don't need to hang around these people anymore. You know, why do we, ha you know, this is a, so I was like, yeah, you know, but now, years later, I came back to magic. It was actually Marilyn Manson who became my biggest fan and his girlfriend at the time, fiance, Evan Rachel Wood. They became my biggest fans and they would literally sing the song to tricks I did, like Puppet Boy, this Devo song. They would know the words to it because they were Googling me or YouTubing me. And um, then just by being on the tour bus and them showing it to other people, I was like, ah, I got to do that again, you know. <laughs> so yeah, recently I've been doing all the different magic conventions, like the Blackpool convention and, and IBM. And this year I, we did IBM, SAM, and Blackpool, all the big ones, you know. And, what, was, uh, what was the reaction like? Because a lot of the new generation magicians would not have grown up with you or ever That's seen right. You. Yeah. Incredible, you know. You know, and it's... Um, you know, it's always fun. You know, I just did a show in like this show in Rome was basically me with other magicians, you know, and um, and it's one of those things. If you create things without, I always tell people, don't, in my opinion, don't perform to the most popular song of the day and don't mm. dress like everyone else is dressing. Don't, you know, try to make your things timeless. That was the great thing about P.B. Herman. Mm. What the hell was that? I mean, uh, he was, <laughs> you know, he really, he looks like, you know, he's a, you know, 30 or 40 year old guy, but acts like a nine year old, you know, and the, but none of it, it was from the eighties and it feels like a sort of this weird eighties, fifties. And that's the same thing. My show, you know, I, I wanted to look like a combination of like the fifties and eighties. I like the eighties just because big hair and shoulder pads and it was goofy and wacky music. Um, and it was the eighties. <laughs> so that was easy, you know, but, um, but I love the 1950s, you know, big fins on, I made my illusions have like fins like from a Cadillac and, you know, all my assistants had like, you know, poodle or not poodle skirts or like bullet bras and, you know, just because it didn't look like Miami Vice, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It looked like something, com combination of different times. So because it's timeless, um, you know, quite a few of those numbers I could even do now and they seem pretty modern you know so yeah it's fun you know going to a magic convention and there's people that you know the the fathers are the ones showing their kids you know <laughs> introducing them to my show but um yeah so it was fun you know and i get to i did um and i get to really work again with my you know friends you know real like brothers like people like kevin james who you know kevin james and i were inseparable you know in magic and uh, he's more, you know, probably the most creative magician there is right now. And, uh, but we got to really reconnect and we did the show called Vaudeville 2000, which we did 29 years ago for the IBM. So we did it this time. Yeah, and it was great. And then 29 years later, I've been trying to re, you know, like put us back together again. You know, this guy, Les Bub, who's a mime from London, but he became famous in London. He had his own kid show and also, you know, but he wasn't really doing the act anymore. And then finally, I just kept bothering him and bothering him, you know, and I really, and finally I got him to say yes. And then called up Kevin and Kevin had six months of gigs with the illusionists straight. But I said that we got to do it, you know, and we ended up doing it for a week at the Magic Castle and then the IBM convention. And it was, and here at the Peacock actually. And um, the last two shows of what was then Vaudeville 3000, you know, so it was us 30 years later. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, for Kevin and I, 
are, uh, you know, my act is pretty physical, but like Les Bub bounces on his back and he does backflips and all that stuff. And, um, you know, it's just funny to, <laughs> these, you know, we get the senior discount at Denny's, but we're still, <laughs> well, you, <laughs> you know. You've got uh, Paul Rubens made another Pee Wee movie last year. He did, yeah. And how old is he? And he looks the same in the movie. He looks the same. Yeah, and it's, um, well, I don't want to say how old he is. I don't know how old he is, you know, because he, to me, he's like young at heart. But yeah, he looks, he looks the same, you he's know, and us. not exactly the same. We all look, yeah, we all look, you know, different. I mean, you know, well, I see people and they really look different. Let's face it. You know what I mean? I can, I can still pass my, some, my you know, my costume's still fit. I'm still, you know, I, I never tried to look like, um, whatever. My show was never about looking like George Clooney or, you know, or like being the pen dragons and having muscles and, you know, it's always been lab coats, which are pretty forgiving, you know? So, um, so you, but you yeah, can, he looks you, like, you can continue oh, go ahead. your, your character for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah. It's fun. And I've done different versions of it. You know, like when I do, I do big music festivals and raves and stuff. So I'll work with big, the big, biggest DJs. I've been doing this before that got popular. Even when I was back in Australia, back with you and you know 1995 i was sneaking off to raves and music things in in melbourne you know yeah. and then uh so um you know so that's always been my secret like i had to sneak away at night because you know, it was an underground scene you know largely illegal back in the day to really go see electronic music mm. in like berlin or or yeah. in melbourne you know there's yeah. these clubs that didn't open till 6 a.m you know and um and now that's the music you hear on the radio. But yeah. I do, I've, I've been friends with these people for years and years. So these, I used to work these raves when they were 500 or 1,000 or 2,000, 3,000. And now the, they have raves and it's 150,000 people. And the main stage will have 60,000. It's the biggest stage in the world, you know, like three city blocks of stage, you know. Um, and I still get to perform on those stages with, with big screens behind me. It's, you know, and my act appeals to them because I, I have four legs or I have killer clowns or robot girls. And, you know, the, and so they're already on drugs in the audience. So it feels, it just adds to it. <laughs> I, I try not to scare them too much, you know. They're, but, seeing, um, they're seeing a completely different show. Yes, they are. I have six legs, eight legs. It's fantastic. <laughs> I look like a spider. But, um, yeah, so my character, you know, I always wanted to look like a character out of my comic book. So, it's, you know, I've, I've done different things and I've done different versions, but it's just, it's fun to come back to, you know, this character's, um, I don't know, it, it's, there's a pure, it's like the Pee Wee thing, you know, Pee Wee, Paul Rubens has done many different characters in movies. He was on this show, 30 Rock, as he's great, different, weird characters. And he's been, you know, he's- He's on Gotham? Uh, huh? Yeah, he's Gotham, and he's and he, yeah, he was the pe he was the Penguin's father in Batman he's Returns. Right. And yeah, so many different things. But in the end, the greatest night of my life was going to see Paul Rubens when he brought Pee Wee back, and he brought the live show back. It was one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life, you know, with the full stage, and it was just goosebumps, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's it's just it's weird to sort of step back in the shoes and you know, the checkered sneakers and <laughs> chainsaws and, you know, and, you know, it's funny thing is, you know, because my act was created, all of it was created with such joy and, you know, enthusiasm that when that music kicks in, you know, it's still, it's fun to me, you know. And you just had a birthday. I mean, you had the birthday. I did. When we spoke last to you were yes. about to have your birthday, had your birthday and you got amazing presents. Again, <laughs> the whole cartoon aspect, people giving you tributes with I, beautiful drawings, beautiful artworks. I know it's crazy, huh? No, but it, it shows you exactly. This is this is what I mean about giving your your mentors, you know, or or it takes. I don't understand why this is, but maybe because people like us, we don't tell people or they're not taught. But if someone inspires you or someone, you know, helps you, promote it. You know, it doesn't. People think that if you have help, that um, or that you didn't succeed all on your own that it takes something away from you and there was even aspects of me you know i mean because i was a shy person i had social anxiety um the disorder really that i didn't want to ask people for help you know what i mean eventually i created my own crew of people around me i would mm. you know i was very shy but i would meet crazy people that are so like with someone like you and me 
we could become quick friends because we have something to talk about where well, I was a shy kid who I can't talk to anybody about sports. You know what I mean? Uh, going to a wedding, literally, I mean, I, I was like a mentally ill person. I could, you know, just being yep. around people talking about normal things. I couldn't do it. I was cause such a weirdo as a kid, you know, you know, so I, the, the world was, I created a world inside my head, you know, yeah. and that, the, eventually, you know, it's, you realize a lot of magicians are kind of like that, you know? Um, but when I did my show in Detroit, years and years ago i was walking down the street and my friend bob self who was my co-writer for my tv specials later he saw this piece of art in a window and said oh my god look at that it's cool it was this mermaid weird fish girl but like done with pastels but really striking we saw it from across the street and then we walked across the street and there was another weird character in a nightclub like a stripper club but it's like pastels and then we look on it and it said andy suriano grade 12 and we were like it's a high school kid. It was like all the art on the, you know, in the shops. So Bob goes, I want to get that painting, you know? And I said, oh, I like that one. It looked like a Tarantino character, you know? So Bob found out what high school it was, found the kid and got him to our show the last week we were in Detroit doing the big version of the Rudy Kobe show, Ooh. the one that was the two hour show, right? Yeah. So the kid came and went crazy. He loved it, obviously. And he was pretty shy, cool kid. And, um, but he was just graduating from high school. He was going to his prom the next week. So he came backstage and I was like, wow, man, I've always wanted to do a comic book. Could you, you, you know, we just got talking. So we came back the next week or the next night or whatever with drawings he did overnight of lab man and they were great you know and i said wow this is fantastic and i said so he was going to his prom the next day i almost went with him i show, i just didn't want to get arrested but i almost went because we really hit it up you should come with us i was almost going to do it but anyway i said what are you doing in like next week or whatever and it literally was a week later or 10 days later because i was going to rome and i was going to spain and i was going to somewhere else i was going to Milan, Rome, and one other place doing a tour. And I was doing Puppet Boy where I get my head cut off. <laughs> and the way that works is there's somebody in a fake Rudy suit and he has to be a little shorter so that he could be the fake person. And I was like, you want to go to Rome? We can work on some art, da, 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 you know. So a week later, his, I had to go meet his parents so they knew I wasn't you know, a pedophile or something. But they... they <laughs> But so anyway, I told him, no, no, go with the yeah, go with the Why crazy not? guy, you know. So me and Bob went and met his dad and his mom and, and said, no, no, you know, we're just one of them. So he went to Rome. He got his head shut off. Met, we met the Muppets on that show, went to Spain, went to – and he started drawing my comic book. And he went – he came to Australia with us. We did – we went and did um, the Adelaide Festival, which was a week or two. We did the top selling act at the Adelaide Festival at the time. And then we went to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. And we were supposed to be there for one week. And we got extended like eight weeks. We stayed there because we did a show at the comedy club there. And we got extended. So the whole time there, he was drawing the Rudy Kobe, the Lab Man comic book, right? So when we came back, you know, time went on. I introduced him to friends of mine at animation studios that were fans of mine. So I introduced him. And then he became, he got, because I knew he was talented enough, you know, and you want to see people that you love succeed, you know. So he went and worked on the Men in Black cartoon, and then he worked on the show called Samurai Jack, and he designed the characters, and he won an Emmy Award. And now he is executive producer for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know. So last week when it was my birthday, he went online and said, this is the guy that gave me my first chance, da, 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 and then drew brand new lab man, you know, design, you know, artwork, you know? So it just shows you that, you know, if you give someone an opportunity, it, it you know, it all comes back to you. The more you, more help you give people and the more you promote other people, they don't forget it. And I think the reason is, is very few people do it. You know, very few people, I don't know, because they're insecure or something, but I find that, all the great things that happened to me have happened because um, I try to help people as much as I can. And even if you get 10% back, you, it's a lot if you help a lot of people, you know? So, um, so what's the future for Rudy Kobe? Is there going to be a, a Rudy Kobe 
cartoon series perhaps <laughs> well you know what it's like i have scripts for a movie that you know we that back in the day you know i, I had a kid series like a, a cartoon series sold with columbia tristar and then i had to wait for the rights to sort of go out and then for a while i wasn't even in magic you know so yeah. you know i've been doing these tours i did china last year for four or five months that was actually fun you know it's Ooh. um and then I discovered that I was signed for three years. They wanted a two year option, you know, which is, a, you know, two years of five months a year is a lot, you know, even though I loved, I loved it. Hmm. So um, I was like, I don't know that I want to do that, you know? And, uh, but then they started talking about, and this other people do this, like franchising my act, like teaching some young guy to do the act. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Cause I know that I don't, I know a couple people that have successfully done it. Like Tape yep. Face is a mime and um, this uh, act called uh, Nightmare or Magic yeah. Utopia in, um, in, uh, and, so and very. Kevin's doing too, Kevin James. Yes, with his son, his stepson, he has his son do the act in The Illusionist. So if Kevin can't do the Mexican tour of The Illusionist, his, mm. his son Bruno, who's a you know a totally different character than Kevin, he, yeah. he franchises the material. But you know, Bruno's a suave, you know, you know, Latin lover, guy, you know, and um, um, so it's a different a different vibe but you know like me finding some jim carrey looking you know and, and or you know more you, know, you need more of a bruce campbell you know yes, guy that's, yeah. yes exactly like a bruce campbell you know guy that but it's a very specific thing you know it's a it's almost harder to find that than a guy that could do magic you know mm. so anyway i thought about that like maybe you know because eventually i had a friend of mine who's a a leader, um, this guy Farside, who has a, this group called the Academy of Villains. And he was a fan of mine since he was a child. And he said that I inspired him to do what he does, right? So he, he told me, he goes, um, he goes, I would give everything up to be lab man. <laughs> I was like, what? And he goes, yeah. He goes, there should be different lab man. You know, lab man, your character. He goes, your show should be, your show should go on, like in a hundred years, there should be a lab band show. It shouldn't just be, you know, Rudy Kobe when Rudy Kobe doesn't want to do it anymore. He said it should be like um, that sh that movie, The Princess Bride, where you have the pirate, Dread Pirate Roberts, and there's different ones that take the role, you know? Mm. And I thought that was the nicest thing that anybody ever told me, yeah. you know? So well, anyway, but well, I've also got the multiverse. very much, yeah, the multiverse, right? And, uh, but um, anyway, one of the, I've lived in Vegas for the last four years. I moved there. Not because I wanted to work in Vegas. I never really wanted to work in Vegas because it was one of those things I used to joke that Vegas was like, when you get old, you know, you go to, you know, they're like, you know, like, you know, um, I'm from New York. So, you know, older Jewish people would go to Miami to retire, you know, mm -hmm. and I said, that's what Vegas is to magicians as a joke when I was young, you know, but then I moved there because not because of the casinos i moved there i needed a change of um i lived in la and i went through some stuff like my mom died and all my props got stolen at one point mm. all my props so i was like in a bad place i was like i need change of scenery and a friend convinced me to move to vegas because it's beautiful out there you can go away from the strip and there's it's called red rocks beautiful mm. mountains and hiking and really lovely and it's only like if ever you go to vegas if you're audience goes to Vegas, 35 minutes away, like a day trip. You can go in the morning and see these beautiful things and come be back in the afternoon for gambling. Mm. And so I moved there about four years ago, but then I started liking, because I love Vegas now, that I'm entertaining the idea of doing a Vegas show. Um, you know, I, but the, so I have someone that will produce it. I have actually two different offers for people say, well, if you want to do it, I'll put the money up. Cause really you can't, there's no such thing as being in a show like Lance Burton anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's all four walls. You have to rent the room yourself, promote, you know, you hire people to do this stuff, but, but it's more, there, there's a couple shows that hire acts, but because shows like Cirque du Soleil, those acts work so cheap. I don't want to, I'm not bad mouthing. It's just true. You know, you get acts from Russia or China and, you know, so those people, when they're out of the Cirque du Soleil shows, they're still good acts, but they have no work. So then they'll work other shows and work very inexpensively. Mm. So, um, so anyway, I'm entertaining the idea of doing a show in Vegas, like just doing it and actually, you know, <laughs> you know, all the things I, I said, I didn't want to end up there, but it's actually, I wouldn't mind it. You know, I look at someone like Matt King who does an afternoon show and he's been there for 20 years. So I went and visited Mac. Mac gets there at noon and he's so relaxed. He's the greatest comedy magician. You have to, if anybody hasn't seen him, you go see Matt King. He's at Harris, the reasonably priced show. Cause it's one o'clock and three o'clock. Mm. 
So he gets there around noon, casually puts on his stuff, da, 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 does a show at one, ends at two. He sells t-shirts, sells stuff, shakes everybody's hand. 2.30 or whatever, you know, goes backstage, resets, or it's already reset, does a show at three, ends at four, signs some autographs. He's home by 4.35 to eat dinner. You know, makes millions of dollars. <laughs> he's been there for 20 years. And, and that, he can do evening shows anywhere in the, in the country. If he yeah. Wants to. Yeah, he takes off and he goes and does like bigger shows at, you know, and he has my friend, since since I've been here, since a week ago with this interview, we convinced my friend Nick DeFott, who's also a friend of Randy's, Nick DeFott, who's uh, to fly down here and spend quarantine with us now, you know, because he went through a breakup, so he, he's down here with us now. That's going to um, be So we crazy. disinfected him and sprayed him down, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the best show. But anyway, Nick is uh, Matt King's. Um, substitute when Matt goes out of town, Nick does his comedy show. He's the, the funniest new uh, magic comedian. Look him up online. He has a great book called Funny that just came out in Magic. It's like twenty dollar book. It's one of the best comedy books. You know, twenty bucks. You know, PayPal him. It's fantastic. Nick Defont. And uh, but anyway, it's um, you know, so just being around Mac and seeing that, and I'm like, well, that's a good life. You know, since I like being in Vegas anyway, you know. If I could find a small room, I don't want like a big room because every show fails quickly, you know, yeah. but if my show is, even though it looks like a big show and it's, you know, it seems like a million different characters, there's a core group of people, like five people. It seems like a cast of a dozen, but they play different roles in the show. Mm. So, but you know what I mean? I at least need this. See what's back there? <laughs> I at least need a small stage. A lot you of the stages in produce, Vegas. Yeah, you can produce the show that you did in Chicago. That's right. I mean, and, and, and it feels big and it feels crazy. And the show I did, like, it's the same material that I'll do in China in front of 5,000 people or, or do it raves in front of 50,000 people. But it all, it can fit on this stage. Mm. But it can't, I can't do it in a comedy club yeah. with people. You know what I mean? I do need a stage and I do need curtains. Yeah. Um, but I don't want it to be too big, you know? Like, I've known people that have gone into the Tropicana um, and – it's a beautiful stage, but it's 1,500 seats. If you don't fill them all, you know, mm. David Copperfield performs in front of 800 people. Mm. You know, people don't know that. It's a fairly small, but he could be packed every night. And he could do three shows on Saturday if he wants. So if I could get a little room for 150 people, 200 people, you know, you work your way up. So that's one idea. I don't know if that'll happen. I'll, you know, I'm, I've been a vagabond and worked in 120 different countries, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> staying you know, on the couch in people's houses you know i may just continue that it's fun but well, look, it's at least there'll be a, an attempt it's been fantastic chatting with you i'm so glad yeah you, you too line this up again and i'm so embarrassed about uh the the record button last time <laughs> i know no we had a, it was funny because we had we had such an incredible talk last week and we've talked about deep stuff like oh, yeah. last it's funny it's funny that the stuff we talked and i think we talked about similarly deep stuff at the beginning of this one but mm. but last week we talked about all the stuff about zoom and performing and it's funny that a lot of it we didn't talk about this time because it's a whole different world the world is changing that quickly it is you it know is. it's incredible yeah yeah and who knows what's going to happen next next week uh, or as you say now that texas has opened up I don't know what's going to happen. That's going to you be know what? And maybe, you know, I shouldn't say this because I know that people are, you know, going through, you know, tough times. And yeah. I, I, you know, so I, I don't want to seem too giddy or, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I'm the luckiest per I am literally the luckiest person in the world that I have people that love me that, you know, that I get to spend time with them. And my, so my quarantine has been, you know, almost like, I'm like, I don't want this to end. You know, it's so much fun because the people I'm staying with, it couldn't be better, you know? So yeah. I don't want to, you know, but even for the people where it's not better, you know, um, I think anytime something like something world changing happens, um, I think it's got to be for the better. You know what I mean? It shakes you up one way or the other. I think it's going to shake up the art we love. I think it's going to shake up magic. Um, you're not going to be able to just do stupid tricks where you're touching people or, you know, being inappropriate or being, you know, there's a and you're also going to have to think on your feet and approach magic differently. And, you know, um, and the more clever you are with it, the more I think commercial you're going to be. So you have a real opportunity and, and the and fact also, that all these, all these zoom shows and, ooh. you know, that's, we've never had the opportunity like this to, you know, it's a whole, different world but if you look at it in a positive way rather than negative um and just know that everything's going to be okay and if you need help 
ask your friends. There's nothing, you know, if you know what I mean, if we're all going through tough times. If yeah. you need help, your friends want to help you, you know? So, um, and it's not just your local friends anymore. We are not global. No. We're truly it's, global. It's global. We're all in the same boat. You know, this is the first time, um, you know, if I really thought about you know, how much, you know, I mean, it's not very many times I've had, you know, um, years of work set up kind of thing. And yeah, boom. I mean, you know, we, I have zero, zero work right now lined up, you know. Um, but I don't know. I'm looking at it like a challenge rather than, you know, a bad thing. Well, well hopefully we'll see you very soon on the stage at the Peacock Theater. And we'll enjoy yes, that. Me, yes. Check out our uh, Facebooks or, you know, and, uh, and we'll post it for sure. It's going to be great. Thank you again so much for, for joining me. We'll see you next time. Thank Goodbye. you.